Today we are in week four of our series on Psalm 119, and if you've been here the last couple of weeks, then you know that Psalm 119 is the longest psalm, but it's also the longest chapter in the Bible, consisting of 176 verses, divided into 22 different sections, eight verses each section, and each section begins with the letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And the whole thing, all of Psalm 119, is a commentary that's in the Bible about the Bible. Because the Bible uh, contains benefits, right? Inherent blessings to those who would take it and read it and then do what it says. That's what we have to do to obtain the benefits and blessings. You have to begin to saturate your life with it, but not just get it in, but you have to obey it. You have to do it. And, uh, and so far, we've gone over eight sections uh, revealing uh, eight benefits. So we, we're in week four. We're going to do three this week, but we've already done eight, week two and week three. And I just want to quickly just uh, remind us what we've been through so far. So, uh, so far, number one, when we read God's word and do what it says, it builds a blessed life. Number two, when we read God's word and do what it says, it keeps us clean. Number three, it shields us against slander, gossip, lies. Number four, it strengthens the weary. Number five, It turns away disgrace when we're in God's word. Number six, it produces freedom. Number seven, it's a source of hope and comfort. Number eight, it helps me to be a good friend. Uh, That's what we've done so far. We got three to do today, sections 9, 10, and 11. So let me pray and then we'll get started. Father God. Father God, I am so, so grateful for each and every person that is here today. They are, they are here and they are ready to hear from your word, to hear from you. And as we open up Psalm 119, Lord, our prayer is that you would, you would give us a deeper appreciation for scripture, for your word, that, that we would begin to develop an even greater desire to read it and to do what it says, that you could give us a hunger for it, that that we would be a people who seek you, Lord, and in doing so, we are saturating our life with your word. Lord, we ask all of this in, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. All right, section nine is, uh, is spelled, uh, the Hebrew letter is spelled T-E-T-H, but it's pronounced Tate, uh, because that T-H in Hebrew is always a hard sound. You know, in English, the T-H for us is a soft sound, but in Hebrew, it's a hard sound. So it is pronounced Tate. Beginning at verse 65, it says, Lord, you have treated your servant well, just as you promised. Teach me good judgment and discernment. I rely on your commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You are good and you do what is good. Teach me your statutes. The arrogant have smeared me with lies, But I obey your precepts with all my heart. Their hearts are hard and insensitive, but I delight in your instruction. It was good for me to be afflicted so that I could learn your statutes. Instruction from your lips is better for me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. Um. The theme that I picked for this section was that uh, God's word gives us wisdom and discernment, gives us wisdom and discernment. And I want you to look at verse 66. This is where I picked this out from. It says, teach me good judgment and discernment. 
Teach me, Lord, good judgment and discernment. I want to talk about that phrase, good judgment, for a moment. Teach me good judgment. What is, what is having good judgment? What is good judgment? I, I certainly think it's a step further than just having good knowledge, right? And having good knowledge is what? It means that you know the right things, that you have the right information, But even when you know the right things and you have the right information, guess what? You can still make poor judgments, even with the right information. So having good judgment means that you're able to discern between what is right and wrong in life or between what is good and what is evil. And then you're able to make a proper judgment about it. You know, you think about a judge who's in a courtroom and a case gets brought to them and all kinds of information is coming at them from both different parties. And and a righteous judge, one who has good judgment, uh, one who is able to make a proper decision um, is, is somebody who we would say has wisdom, right? I mean, when you talk about wisdom in the Bible, I think it's talking about having the right information and then being able to make a good judgment. That's really wisdom. Uh, wisdom is, is having the ability to make a good judgment, and that is to be able to discern between what is right and wrong, what is good and evil, and not only having the right information, but then making a proper decision based on wisdom. And what this section uh, in, in Psalm 119 is reminding us of is that a, a, a big purpose that God's word serves in our lives is that by being in it, we gain wisdom and discernment, God's wisdom, God's discernment, because think about it for a minute. There are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of decisions that a person makes in his or her own lifetime. You know, some of those decisions are everyday decisions, mundane decisions, but we also know that some of those decisions are critical decisions. They're like life-changing, life-altering decisions. And in making decisions... I would believe that we're all sort of in a desperate position where we need wisdom and discernment from God about making all of the decisions that we have to make in in our lives, whether they be mundane or they're critical decisions. And what I've learned in my life is there really isn't much hope for me to make wise, to have wisdom in terms of decisions, to, to, to know God's way and to, and to make godly decisions in my life without the direction that I receive from God's word. God's word is what gives me wisdom and what gives me discernment when I'm making decisions in my life. I can't tell you, there have been so many times in my life where something major happens, and honestly, I'm at a loss. I I, I don't know what to do about it. I I don't know how to handle something, or, you know, I'm unclear as to what my next step should, should be or how I should handle a particular situation. I don't have clarity about it, and, and I know that I need wisdom uh, to, you know, walking through it. I, I want to be able to discern what is God's way to walk through this. I mean, what am I supposed to do? And, and so what do I do in my life? What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to pick up God's word and we're supposed to begin to search God's word, search out God's word, see if there's anything in God's word that has anything to do with, or it has anything to say to the situation that, that I am dealing with at that particular time in, in my life. So I turn 
to the word of God. Why do I do that? To gain wisdom and discernment from God as I am trying to maneuver through the situation that I am dealing with. And I think that's what the psalmist here is, is, is basically doing in this section, right? It says that, that, that he was afflicted and, and, and had gone astray, but then, you know, through that affliction that they turned to God and began to look into and search out God's statutes for what direction to go? I mean, look at verse 67. Verse 67, it says, before I was afflicted and I went astray, but now I keep your word. So the word must have affected this psalmist's life in some way as he was going through that affliction. In verse 71, it says, it was good for me to be afflicted. Why? So that I could learn from your statutes. My, my affliction drove me into your word. It drove me into your word so I, could, so I could gain some wisdom, so I could get some discernment about my situation. Friends, your difficulties, the trials that you go through, the bad things that happen to you in your life, you ought to look at them as motivators to open up God's word and to search out, you know, the scripture to find, to find some wisdom from God about what to do, to find some discernment, to, to gain some, you know, good judgment, not only trying to find what the right information is that you need, but what decisions to make in your life based on that right information. That's good judgment. And, and I can't tell you the number of times that that going to God's word um, has, has spared me from even greater trouble and affliction simply because I decided to, to search out God's word. I decided to open up his word. I decided to, to try to gain some wisdom and discernment from God's word about my situation and what I'm supposed to do with, with what has happened and... Um, and God has spared me from even greater trouble and affliction because I was willing to, to go to his word. Okay, so th this theme that, that, that going to the word gives us wisdom and discernment in the situations that we are going through in our lives. All right, that's section nine. Section 10 is... Uh, the Hebrew letter is spelled Y-O-D, and it's pronounced Yod. So let's read it. Verse 73, your hands made me and formed me. Give me understanding so I can learn your commands. Those who fear you will see me and rejoice, for I put my hope in your word. I know, Lord, that your judgments are just and that you have afflicted me fairly. May your faithful love comfort me as you promised your servant. May your compassion come to me so that I may live, for your instruction is my delight. Let the arrogant be put to shame for slandering me with lies. I will meditate on your precepts. Those who fear you, those who know your decrees, turn to me. May my heart be blameless regarding your statutes so that I will not be put to shame. Um, I, I want to point you to verse 75 here uh, where it says, you have afflicted me fairly. Um, in, in this psalmist, uh, or in this section, the psalmist is talking about affliction again. The only difference is in this section, who is the one doing the afflicting? It's God, right? He says, you, God, you are the source of my affliction. You have afflicted me, and it's been fair. I, I am assessing your affliction, and, and you have been fair to me. So, so something obviously is going on in the life of the psalmist where God is needing to step in and, um, 
and I guess cause some pain. You know, what, 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 is, what is it called when somebody steps into your life and causes pain? When, when they put you over their lap and, they, and they're going to spank you, right? That's called discipline, isn't it? And, and there was probably, I don't know what the issue was. Maybe it was a sin issue that needed to be dealt with that needed to be surrendered to the Lord, but the Lord is coming into this person's life and disciplining them, right? Putting some punishment upon them. Why? Because he's trying to correct them. He's trying to refine them to make them a better man of God. And so, so the theme that I sort of drew out of this section is that the word of God shows us God's love through discipline. It shows God's love through discipline. You afflicted me, the psalmist says. And then he continues and he says, may, may your faithful love, your unfailing love be my comfort. And then in 77, he says, let your compassion, you know, be on me, like come to me that I may live and not die. So the affliction that he has been fairly receiving is trying, the Lord is trying to keep him from death. Have you ever felt like God is disciplining you in your life? And again, that picture is that God is taking you over his knee and he is putting his heavy hand on you. You know, he's going to give you a good spanking. Have you ever, have you ever got a good spanking from, from the Lord? Have you, have you ever felt that God is punishing you, fairly afflicting you, in, in your life. You know why God disciplines us? He, he does it because he loves us. He loves us. That's what discipline from a parent is about, is about love. It's trying to keep them from danger. It's trying to, it's trying to do what's best for, for the child. I, I, I want to turn to Hebrews chapter 12, where, where it talks a little section on God's discipline. And I just want to read it to you. Um, so it'll be on the screen here. Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse five says, my son, do not take the Lord's discipline lightly or lose heart when you are reproved by him for the Lord disciplines, the one he loves, he, and punishes every son he receives. It goes on and says, endure suffering as discipline. God is dealing with you as sons. For what son is there that a father does not discipline? But, but if you are without discipline, which, which all receive, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had human fathers discipline us and we respected them. Shouldn't we submit even more to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time based on what seemed good to them, but he, God, does it for our benefit so that we can, what? Share in his holiness, so that we can share his holiness. No discipline seems enjoyable at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. There's three quick things from this Hebrews passage that I just want to point out about God's discipline. Number one, God's discipline means that he loves you. If, if you are feeling affliction from God, it's because he loves you. The Lord disciplines those that he loves. Think about it. God is never content to allow you to remain where you are especially if you are caught up in sin or, or you are in darkness in your life or you are in rebellion in, in your life. He, he doesn't want that for you. And so out of a deep love, and, and we all know those of us who have disciplined our own children, it is not, it is not fun to discipline your children, but, but God disciplines us. He, he sends affliction our direction wants to correct us because he loves us. And yeah, no, it's not enjoyable. You know, discipline's not pleasant at the time. It says it's going to be painful. 
Yet, it yields the fruit of righteousness for those that, that receive it. So God's discipline, if you're being disciplined, it means that he loves you. Secondly, it means that you're his child. It, it was talking about here that if you're not getting disciplined, then most likely you're illegitimate, meaning that that parent doesn't care about you. He doesn't care if you're going the wrong direction or going to be, you know, fall into danger or, or get hurt. or it, 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 it. Unless you are a true son or daughter, unless you have been adopted and, 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 and God is dealing with you as one of his own, if you're being disciplined, you're not illegitimate. You're one of his own. Just like any good, loving parent, you know, uh, is going to discipline you because he wants what's best for you and he wants to correct you. If you're being disciplined by God, it's just showing you that you are his. I mean, the most unloving thing that a parent can do is to never discipline their kids. Oh, that'd be all right. Just let them run wild, you know. Look, yeah, they'll figure it out. They'll get into all kinds of trouble. I'll tell you what's going to happen. Undisciplined kids grow up to be delinquent. And if you're delinquent, that means you're a lawbreaker. And if you're a lawbreaker, that means you're going to end up being a criminal. And, um, and we know where that leads. Another thing, and I didn't know if I want to bring this up, but when I thought about like my parents' generation and my grandparents' generation, it used to be that, you know, in the neighborhood, say Jimmy lived down way down the street or way down the block. If, J if Jimmy was at our house, you know, um, the, the, and was doing something that needed, that needed to be corrected or needed some discipline, you know, hey, you're, you're here, Jimmy. Uh, we're good. <laughs> He got disciplined, right? That, that was that, that generation. It didn't matter. Didn't even we didn't even have to know Jimmy. We just know he's in the neighborhood. He's walking down the sidewalk. If he does something wrong, you, you're going to go out and you have full responsibility to discipline Jimmy right there in front of the whole neighborhood. Well, it's not like that today. <laughs> you know, things have changed a little bit. Um, you, you certainly... Well, let's just say, just try to discipline somebody else's kid with the way that you want to discipline them. That it, it, it just doesn't work today. Um, and what's right or wrong, I don't know. But what my point is this, is that our Heavenly Father is the one who has the right to discipline us. Why? Because we're His. We belong to Him. It means you are a son or a daughter and that He loves you. And then the last thing that I want to mention here in this Hebrews passage is um, when, when God's disciplining you, it means that he is wanting to teach you something, right? That, that word in the original Greek to, to discipline means to train or to teach or to instruct or to educate. So the very fact that God is disciplining you just means that you still have something to learn, Right? That there is some lesson that God is trying to teach you. So learn it, right? I mean, the, the, I found the quicker that I learn it, the easier life goes for me. And the slower I learn it, the more discipline the Lord sends my direction. You know, so if God's trying to teach you something, learn it, learn it. You know, I was thinking about Jesus, you know, because his father afflicted him. But was it for anything wrong that he did? I don't think so. Yet he was still afflicted by the father. Why? Because it was for somebody else's benefit. Sometimes in life we can... We can be being afflicted by God, and it's, it's just because somebody else is going to benefit, that God has, is trying to do something for somebody else. And so you, you are suffering through that, that affliction as well. So God, uh, section number 10, 
is God's word uh, shows God's love through discipline. All right, let's look at the last section for today, section 11. And section 11 is spelled K-A-P-H, um, but it's pronounced cough. Sounds just like what you do when you're sick. You know, cough, you know, cough. Um, let's read it together. I long for your salvation. I put my hope in your word. My eyes grow weary looking for what you have promised. I ask, when will you comfort me? Though I have become like a wineskin dried by smoke, I do not forget your statutes. H how many days must your servant wait? When will you execute judgment on my persecutors? The arrogant have dug pits for me. They violate your instruction. All your commands are true. People persecute me with lies. Help me. Help me. They almost ended my life on earth, but I did not abandon your precepts. Give me life in accordance with your faithful love, and I will obey the decree that you have spoken. Look at verse 87 here for a second. The psalmist is in trouble, right? He, he, he says, they almost ended my life on earth. I, I, I'm almo I've almost been wiped out from the face of the earth. And he's crying out to God and he's desperate and, and people are after him and his life is in jeopardy and he's, he's crying out, help me, help me. And then he's pointing out the fact that God's not doing anything about it. When, when are you going to do something about it? What, 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 how long am I going to have to wait? When are you going to execute some kind of judgment against my persecutors? Friends, this, this section here, it, it, it reminded me about God's timing. That there's an interesting phrase that he uses in verse 83 here. It's, he says this. He says that I have become like a wineskin dried by smoke. Now, let me explain that. In ancient times, they would skin an animal and then they would stitch up that skin of that animal, the hide of the animal, so that it would be used like a, like a bottle. They would stitch it up. It would be a vessel to hold liquid in. You know, that's where they, the, the, they would put wine in there. It would be like a wine bottle for us today, but they made it out of animal skin, so it was like a wine skin. And a lot of times what they would do is they would hang that wine skin on the branch of a tree, like when you're traveling is when you would have a bottle, you know, you're taking it with you. Um, so uh, they'd hang it on a branch of a tree, try to keep it off the ground, they, or they'd hang it up, you know, that, where they'd make a makeshift tent. They would maybe hang it on the top of, uh, you know, the, the highest point on the tent. And a lot of times when you're traveling with a wineskin and you're setting up a temporary camp, you got a campfire, right? And so the smoke of the campfire would be just billowing up onto the wineskin. And what would happen is it would dry it out, especially if it was hung too close to the fire. You know, the smoke would come up and then the smoke would, would damage the wineskin. It would, it would become covered with soot and the smoke would dry it out and... That skin would become brittle to the point where it would crack and then it would begin to leak. And then guess what? It's no longer useless for which it was stitched up to be, right? It, 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 it's useless. It's no longer served its purpose. And, and the psalmist is using this phrase here describing how he feels. He's like, God, I'm, I'm like a wineskin dried by smoke. I, I'm, I'm broken. I'm, I'm dried out. I, I feel useless. I, I, I don't even have a purpose anymore. I, 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 I'm a wineskin dried by smoke. And, and here's the key to this, this whole section. The psalmist is complaining, right? He's complaining to God because God's not helping him. He's crying out for help and God's not not, not doing what he wants him to do. And, 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 you know, 
So God's not doing anything about it. I mean, look at verse 82 right here. He says, when, when will you comfort me? In 84, how, how long do I have to wait? How many days? When are you going to execute judgment? Where are you, God? We've all felt like this, probably a lot, right? Like, God, you're not listening to me, you know? It, I feel like you're not listening because if, if you were listening, you would be involved here. You're not showing up. I want something to happen here, and it, it's not happening, right? The, 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 the psalmist is wrestling with God's involvement, and usually with God's involvement, it's about God's timing in, in all of it, right? I mean, look at, verse, look at verse 81. He says, I long for your salvation, and, and I put my hope in, in your word. I long for you to come and rescue me from this, and I'm going to put my hope in your word Friends, if there's one thing that the word of God has taught me, it's to wait on the Lord, to wait on God's timing, to know that God's timing is perfect, that God's timing is always perfect. And, and, and so what the Bible does is that it helps me to recalibrate my life. What, what do I mean by that? It helps me to be able to slow down in my life and to trust in God's timing, to wait on God. Because what we're usually, we're usually in this, this attitude wanting God to work faster than he is working in our lives, right? And, and it's because we live in a culture, you know, we're guilty. This, this world that we live in is so fast-paced. I mean, even in the last 20 or 30 years, I mean, think about the instant gratification that we have now. You know, we can, we can get anything delivered to our door, you know, within an hour and <laughs> give me what I want and give it to me right now. And so, God, you're in that department in my life and just, Will you just get her done? You know, speed it up here. And being in God's word helps me recalibrate that in, in my life. It says, Rob, you need to be patient. You need to wait. You need to slow down. And you need to yield. You, you, you know what yielding is, right? When you're like going up a ramp, merging onto a highway, what, what, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to look for oncoming traffic and you're supposed to yield to it, which means slow down, don't cut in front of it. You're supposed to let it go and then you're supposed to come in behind it and you're supposed to match its speed, right? That, that's, what, that's what yielding is. And I think that's what God's word does to me in my in my life it helps me to go through that process when it comes to what God is is doing in 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 my life because the last thing I want to do is is get out in front of God right is is just to pedal to the metal and cut in in front of God no God's word reminds me that, that I need to that I need to wait, that I need to take a step back, that I need to stop, that I need to yield, that I need to let God go ahead so I can fall in behind him and that I can take my lead f from, from him. I need to follow God, yield to God. My life is not about my own timeline. My life is about his timeline. And I need to get back in step with God. And so, friends, this, this section reveals to us God's perfect timing. And, 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 and it says to us, look, you need to trust in God's perfect timing. 
So, so that's the, the three themes for today. That's the benefits that we glean from God's word today. Number nine, uh, so being in God's word gives us wisdom and discernment. Number 10, it shows God's love in our life through his discipline in, in our life. And number 11, it reveals to us God's perfect timing, that we would trust in God's perfect timing. And so we'll pick up with number 12 next week, but I just want to, speaking of God's perfect timing, I want to read to you a verse, and we are getting ready to partake together the body and blood of Christ. I just want to read to you a verse from Romans chapter 5, verse 6. It says this, that at just the right time, while, while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. At just the right time, while we were powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Do you realize that Jesus is our Savior? That he saved you from ruin? That, that he has saved you from sin and, and, and death and, 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 and the grave and, and hell? That, that, that while we were powerless against any of that stuff in our own lives, there's no way we could live a righteous life in order to be with God forever and avoid the punishment that was upon us because of our sin that Christ died for the ungodly, for you, for me. That's why we're here this morning. All glory, all honor, all praise goes to Jesus Christ, for he has saved you. He has rescued you. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and he gave thanks, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take and eat. This, this is my body. And then he took the cup and he gave thanks and offered it to them and, and said, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, we just thank you for this time that we have had together where we can be in your word. Lord Jesus, we thank you for rescuing us at just the right time. Lord, we thank you for the wisdom and discernment that you give us when we are in you, when we are in your word. We thank you uh, that you discipline us because you love us. You, you don't want us to be in danger. You don't want us to fall into death. You deeply love us and want to, to bring us back to you. And Lord, will you please help us to trust in your timing, to just yield and to wait on you and to let you back in front that we may follow you and let you lead. And we pray this in your name and everybody said. Hi, I'm Shelly, and I just want to say thank you for joining us online today. One of the things that we believe here at FCC is that you can't do life alone. And so while we're grateful for the technology that allows us to live stream and archive our service and sermons, the reality is that watching online pales in comparison to coming in person and being with people, interacting face to face. And so our encouragement to you is that if you're local, that you would come check us out in person. We would love to get to know you and help you get connected. And if you're not local, we pray that you can find a church near you where you can build relationships there. If you would like more information about FCC, or you'd like to give online, or you'd like to submit a prayer request, or even let us know that you're going to join us in person on Sunday morning, you can do all of that on our website, fortvillechristian.com, and we would love to see you here.